Hello everyone, and welcome to Soft Stories. I'm Stratton, and today we are going to be continuing our reading of Silas Hawking's Real Grit. We are getting very close to the end of the story now. Only six chapters to go, and so that means we'll be finished in a scant three weeks which is a bit of a surprise to me. It seems to have simply flown by. I hope that you have enjoyed this swift journey as much as I have. When last we left the story, poor Jack Formby could still not catch a break, in spite of all his good works, caring for the fever-stricken, in his encampment, or perhaps because of those same good works, he fell ill himself, and it was pronounced by the doctor that the outlook for him was poor, his strength was drained from caring for the sick for so long, seeing his good friend Nick Whiffle succumb to the illness, and eventually find peace. And it looks as though Jack will meet the same fate. But as I say, there is more to the story, and so we must continue. With chapter 30, Reviving Hopes. The day following that on which the doctor had pronounced his opinion that Jack would not recover, Ada Woodville might have been seen sitting under a tall sycamore tree that grew in front of Trevenna House, with a copy of the West Britain newspaper lying upon her lap. It was a still, drowsy day with scarcely breeze enough to stir a blade of grass. Far out in the bay and beyond the headland she could see the great ocean lying still as a summer pool, while in the valley below the river glided on with scarcely a ripple upon its bosom and without a murmur to disturb the quiet of the afternoon. The village children were all at school, and the fishermen, too, were far out at sea, too far for their songs to be heard. Even the birds had ceased their singing, while the cattle lazily chewed their cuds down by the waterside, and seemed too content to make a sound. We actually have an image of that bucolic scene. And here is Ada Woodville staring upon the great ocean, looking out at the lazy, quiet afternoon. Ada had nearly fallen asleep when her eye was arrested by a paragraph headed heroism in everyday life. This was followed by a description of a navvy encampment in Yorkshire, the breaking out of an epidemic of fever, the terror of many of the men, and the heroism of the nurses, who went from Bradfield to nurse the stricken navvies. But prominently among the rest, the article went on to say, will stand out the name of Mr. John Robinson, one of the subcontractors. Three years ago, Mr. Robinson came into the Fernbeck Valley seeking work as a navvy. Though dressed as an ordinary labourer, it was seen at once that he was no common man. Young in years, handsome in appearance, graceful in movement, correct in speech, he became at once a man of mark. 
perhaps it would have been more correct to say he became a target, at which the more jealous and ungenerous part of the camp hurled their shafts of scorn and insult. They nicknamed him the Duke, and persecuted him in every possible way. All this he bore, however, without complaining. Never did he show any resentment, and whenever he could do his persecutors a good turn, he did it. At first, it was thought he was lacking in courage and energy, but he soon undeceived them, and in an encounter with the champion of the camp, into which he was driven, he came off victor. This display of courage and skill turned the tide in his favour, and he soon became a general favourite. As a workman, he early attracted the notice of his employer. Never slovenly, never late. Whatever he did, he did with his might. As a consequence, he was soon elevated to the position of ganger. From this, chiefly through the influences of the son of the chief contractor, Sir Francis Lashton, he was enabled to take a small contract on his own account, and carried it through with marked ability and success. This prepared the way to the position he now occupies as one of the largest subcontractors. Such a rapid success is not often witnessed in these times. During the last year, Mr. Robinson has conducted a weekly Bible reading amongst the navvies with marked ability, and when the fever broke out, and the terror-stricken men were leaving the camp by scores, and the sick and dying were left uncared for, this young hero called his men together and told them they must carry on their work without him, as he was going to the rescue of his stricken comrades. Do the work well, he said, and don't let it be said if I die that anything I undertook was done badly. From that day till the day he himself was smitten down, he was ever at the bedside of the sufferers. With all the strength of a man, and with all the tenderness of a woman, he ministered to the wants of the sick and dying, until they blessed him as an angel from above. And now he himself lies at the point of death. Surely all good people and true will join in the prayer that a life of so much virtue and promise may be spared. Whether or not he has any friends or relatives in the country, no one can tell. Of his past life, he's silent. That he's a gentleman by birth and education, there can be no doubt. That he's a gentleman in a much higher sense is equally certain, and all who admire real worth, in whatever station it may be found, will cherish the hope that his sickness may not have a fatal termination. Bradfield Mercury Ada was wide enough, awake long before she reached the end of the article. Can it be possible? was her thought that this is Jack Formby? It was getting on to three years and a half ago since she saw that face in the crowd which had so strangely affected her. If that were Jack, he might, then, be on his way to Yorkshire. And yet, if it were he, he would surely have made himself known long before this. Ada had long since given up Jack as dead, though his image remained enshrined in her heart as firmly as ever. Scarcely a day passed that she did not look at his portrait in her album and think of what might have been if she had given him a word of hope when first he declared his love. During the past three years, she had spent nearly all her time at Trevenna. Since Dick had left Netherby Hall, it had never seemed quite the same to her. Besides which, so many painful memories gathered about the place that she felt happier in her Cornish home than anywhere else. The new vicarage had been completed now more than a year so that Mr. Tregoni no longer occupied her old home. But she had secured an excellent couple, man and wife, as gardener and housekeeper, and felt much less lonely than she had anticipated. 
Madge came up to Trevenna House every day, or else she went down to the vicarage. And so the days and months and seasons came and went, and Ada was as happy as she ever expected to be on earth. Yet she knew that this state of affairs could not always continue. To live the life of an old maid was by no means her ideal of a woman's life, and though she could never love another as she had loved Jack Formby, she thought she might be happy, and very useful, as the wife of his cousin, Ralph. He had been wonderfully kind to her during the past three years, and had made quite a name in the county as an earnest philanthropist and a brilliant speaker. The little village of Trevenna was quite in love with him, for he had spoken at three crowded meetings, and had stirred their enthusiasm to the highest pitch. Mr. Tregoni had taken to him as he had never taken to anybody before in his life, while Ada could not help regarding him with growing admiration. Only a few weeks ago he had formally proposed to her, and at her earnest solicitation he had agreed to wait for her answer until October, when he would be visiting Cornwall again. He had little doubt that the answer would be what he desired. If she had meant to reject him, she would have done so at once. He knew she was incapable of an act of unkindness, and would therefore never be so cruel as to keep him waiting in suspense for three months, and then throw him over. Practically, she had accepted him, so he argued with himself and he quite anticipated being the master of Trevenna House by Christmas, or early in the new year, at the latest. He was very little at Bodleford now. To begin with, he and Mr. Toadsby were not so friendly as formerly, and he was afraid if he remained in Bodleford, they might come to an open rupture, which would be very awkward, for, as his he as he said to himself, Toadsby wouldn't mind a bit, confessing himself a rogue, to prove that I am one. Hence, a quarrel with Toadsby was to be avoided. Then, in the second place, he found it would be more convenient, and much more advantageous to himself, to have the headquarters of the Imperial Federation in London than in any provincial city. And in the third place, he did not care to be constantly under the eye of John Formby Sr. The less the old fool sees of me, the better he'll like me, and the greater my chance of being his heir, he said to himself. Under these circumstances, therefore, he had removed to London, and found that the change answered admirably. Donations and subscriptions flowed constantly into the funds of the Federation, while the profits from imperial badges formed quite a snug little income. With John Formby he kept up a regular correspondence, and was evidently growing in favour with that individual. His only fear was that Toadsby might one day play the fool, as he put it, and out of sheer spite expose him to the world. Should the time ever come when the public demanded an investigation of his affairs, he knew the game would be up. If Toadsby kept silent, he had little to fear. If, on the other hand, Toadsby began to tattle, he might have to hurry away suddenly without even the chance of saying goodbye to his friends. He rarely, however, let any thoughts of Toadsby trouble him. He 
he had played his game with so much skill for so many years that he had very little to fear relative to that future. To Ada he confided all his plans, or appeared to, and when attempting some new philanthropic enterprise, would sometimes write, asking her opinion or soliciting her advice. This was naturally very gratifying to our heroine. To do good was her greatest joy, and to render assistance to one so fertile in schemes for the elevation of the human race as Ralph Formby was something to be proud of. She sometimes wondered how it was that she gave all her heart and all her love to idle, wasteful, easy-going Jack, while for his noble, self-sacrificing cousin, she had only a sisterly regard at best. It was strange to her that her heart should still cling to Jack's memory, and that in spite of reason and logic, she kept fancying that he might some day appear suddenly upon the scene. She had told Madge again and again that she quite believed now that Jack was dead, that she had no longer the smallest reason for cherishing the hope that he might be alive. And yet, in spite of it all, her love lived, and her hope would not die. And now this newspaper paragraph was as the breath of heaven to the dying embers. The flame shot up again and seemed to illumine her life. Again and again she read the paragraph, and then gave herself up to reflection. It must be he, she said to herself. The time will correspond, and Jack was just the man to do a noble work like that. He would not shrink from labour or self-sacrifice, for he had not a selfish fibre in him. But why is he kept silent? Ah, now I know. It was to try me as well as himself. He spoke to me that day on which he left his kiss upon my lips, of coming back in four or five years. I knew he was noble from the first, and only wanted the opportunity to show his worth. And now he has made the country ring with his praise, but has hidden his real name. Oh yes, it is Jack. Something tells me that I cannot be mistaken. And something tells me, too, that he will recover. And that I shall see his face again. She did not show the paragraph to Madge, or say anything of the hopes and fears that haunted her. But every day she scanned the papers with an anxious face and with a throbbing heart. And when a fortnight passed away and no further intelligence was vouchsafed, she wrote a timid letter of inquiry to the editor of the Bradfield Mercury, and waited anxiously for the answer. Chapter 31 A Moment of Madness Fifteen anxious days came and went, and still no answer to the letter. She had grown quite pale with hope deferred, and was at her wit's end to know what course to adopt in order to get hold of the information she desired. On the sixteenth day, however, she received by post a copy of the Bradfield Mercury of the previous day. Hastily tearing off the wrapper, she quickly discovered a paragraph, crossed at the corners with blue lead, and in a moment had devoured its contents. The fever epidemic had died out. John Robinson was the last attacked. Everybody would rejoice that he was now convalescent, 
and had been ordered away for a change of air. The paragraph contained many other items of interest, but the above was all that Ada saw in her first rapid glance, and was all, indeed, that she desired to know. The conviction that John Robinson was none other than Jack Formby now amounted in her mind to an absolute certainty, and if he had walked into the house at that very moment, she would not have been in the least surprised. He will come some day, she said to herself, so I will be on the watch. He told me more than once that he never loved but me, and that he should never love another. And I know he will come. And she began to hum to herself. He is coming, my own, my sweet, were it ever so airy a tread. My heart would hear it and beat, were it earth in an earthy bed. For a while, she did not notice a letter that had come by the same post, though the handwriting was almost as familiar to her as her own. When she picked it up at length, something very near akin to a frown darkened her face. I wonder what Ralph can want, she said to herself as she tore open the envelope. Coming again next week, she said, half aloud as she quickly scanned the epistle. Not very well. Well, I'm sorry for that. Wants to have some talk with me relative to some new undertaking. She'll spend a few days at the farm on the cliffs, his old quarters. Remembers my request and will be honoured to wait for my answer till October, but is nevertheless hungering for a sight of my face. Oh, nonsense, she said half petulantly. Ralph is splendid until he begins to talk love, and yet I had quite resolved to accept his offer. I'm thankful I asked him to wait. It would have been better for both if I had said no at the first, for this new hope has changed everything. Yet day after day, she kept the hope to herself, not even taking Madge into her confidence. It would be such a surprise to her friend if Jack should turn up, and how proud she would be to introduce him as the hero of the Navy camp on the Yorkshire Moors. Madge had never cared for Ralph, nor did she care for him now. She did not want Ada to be his wife. But she will like Jack, I know, and when she hears the story of his bravery, won't she open her eyes? So Ada communed with herself as the days passed on, and she kept hoping that Jack would come. He knows that my home is at Trevenna, she said to herself, and he will find his way. Would it not be a surprise to Ralph to come and find Jack here? That would settle everything without any further trouble. Now and then, a fear haunted her that her hope, after all, might prove a delusion. That this brave John Robinson was only John Robinson and no one else. But she never entertained it for long altogether. Every day she listened for Jack's footfalls, and hoped that before evening she would see his face. 
by a strange coincidence, Jack and Ralph travelled into Cornwall on the same day, though they travelled by different trains and alighted at different stations. Jack had three objects in view. Firstly, to look at some work that wanted doing in St. Tivy Bay, with a view to undertaking it. Secondly, to recruit his health. And thirdly, to find, if possible, Ada Woodville. Sir Francis Lashton had a number of contracts in different parts of the country, among the rest he had undertaken to build a breakwater, a construct, and construct a basin or a dock at St. Tivy. For the latter, a good deal of excavation was necessary, and so pleased had he been with the work Jack had hitherto done in that direction, that he offered him the first refusal of the work at St. Tivy. As the railway was now drawing near completion, Jack jumped at the offer, and lost no time in preparing for the journey. He was still very weak and pale, scarcely more than a shadow of his former self, but every day he felt his strength returning, and had no doubt that in a few weeks he would feel as strong as ever. He spent two days at St. Tivy in what he termed prospecting, that is, examining the rock, testing the ground, taking measurements, etc. And on the third day, he started for Trevenna, which, taking a narrow path along the cliffs, was only about five miles away. He had instituted a number of inquiries while at St. Tivy, respecting the village of Trevenna and its inhabitants, and had learned that Ada was the Lady Bountiful of the district, that she spent most of her time in her old home, which at one time it was feared she would not do, that she was still unmarried, though rumour had said she was going to be married in the spring that the bridegroom was a gentleman from the north of England, and a well-known philanthropist. And, lastly, that he had been seen in the neighbourhood within the past few days. Jack heard all this with very mingled feelings. That Ada admired his cousin Ralph, he knew, and it was not at all unnatural that admiration should, in time, grow into love. And if, when he got to Trevenna, he discovered that she was actually engaged to be married to Ralph, he would breathe no word of his own love, or of his long-cherished hope, but would accept the inevitable with the best possible grace, and would wish her every possible joy. Indeed, he proposed and composed a little speech as he sauntered leisurely along the cliffs that sunny August afternoon, to deliver to Ada in case he discovered the rumour of her engagement was true. I wonder how she will receive me he said to himself, and whether I shall find her as beautiful as when I saw her last. Perhaps she's forgotten me, for dead people are proverbially soon forgotten, and I have been dead to her for many years. She will soon recognise me, however, for I have not altered much and the fever has taken all the tan from my face. I hope I shall be able to keep cool and collected, for I am dreadfully excited. 
It seemed a rarely used path along which he was walking, for he had not met a single individual since he left St. Tivy. He was rather thankful for that than otherwise. He wanted to be alone, so that his imagination might have full play, and his thoughts run on unchecked. Far down at his feet, the long sea swell broke on the rocks with a subdued musical plash, and that was about the only sound that broke the stillness of the afternoon. Now and then, he sat down on some bank or boulder to rest a while. Not that he was tired, or anxious to lengthen out his journey. On the contrary, he was anxious and impatient to see Ada face to face and learn the truth from her own lips. And yet he almost dreaded the meeting, lest the dearest hope of his life should be blotted out for ever. For years past he had tried to do his duty for its own sake, to leave all hope of winning Ada Woodville out of the question. But as he looked back over those years, he saw very clearly that the thought of Ada had been ever present with him and the hope of winning her approval had been a prominent factor in his life. It's true, there had been times when that hope had nearly died out, but as he steadily won his way, the old hope gradually revived, and today it outweighed every other feeling. At length, the hills began to slope in another direction, and he saw in the distance the graceful curve of Trevenna Bay. A little farther, and he knew the village would loom into sight, and the very house where lived his love. He might even meet her, walking on the cliffs, for she loved the downs in the olden days and had often pictured to him the scene that was now spread out before him. He knew the place, though he had never seen it before. He should recognise directly the ivied church among the trees, and the quiet river gliding through the valley. Perhaps he would find her walking in the garden, or on the grassy lawn, Oh, how his heart throbbed, while his breath came in quick, short gasps. In a little while now, his fate would be sealed. His life was reaching its climax. The hope of years would be realised, or else... A quick, firm step sounded behind him, which he had not heard until this moment. Nearer and nearer it came... He stepped aside to let the stranger pass, and looked him full in the face at the same time. A mutual exclamation of surprise burst simultaneously from each lip, and involuntarily stepped backwards. A startled expression on the newcomer's face, and then their hands met. "'Why, Jack, I thought you were dead long ago.' "'No, Ralph.' You see, I'm living still, and very little changed by Jove, and you are not changed at all. Thank you. Are you making a long stay here? I uh, hardly know. I came to St. Tivy three days ago. I'm going to Trevenna now to see Miss Woodville. Oh. Does she know you're here? No. She does not know that I'm alive. You're not aware, then, that we're to be married soon? No, with a sickly smile, I wish you joy. Hmm, thanks, old fellow. I have no doubt I shall be happy. Have you been to Bodleford of late? No. Then you have not seen your Uncle John, my 
my Uncle John? Yes, he returned from Australia directly after you so mysteriously disappeared. Uh, indeed, that is strange. I thought he was dead. As we all thought you were. For a while, Jack did not reply, while Ralph regarded him with a sinister expression. You're going my way? Jack said at length. Yes. So, they walked along, side by side, for the most part in silence, for each was busy with his own thoughts. Jack was thinking chiefly of Ada, Ralph, of himself. In a moment, all that he had hoped for, plotted for, waited for, sinned for, was in danger of being torn from his grasp. The one barrier that stood between him and wealth, station, happiness, and which he had fondly dreamed, had been forever removed, had suddenly reappeared. Why was this man alive? Why should he suddenly come between him and all that he coveted most? Oh, that he were lying dead on the rocks below. Then his way would be clear, and all his ambition would soon be realised. Their path, at this moment, skirted the very edge of the cliff. There wasn't a soul in sight. Jack was on the outer edge. A little push, and all would be over. No one would ever know. Dead men tell no tales. Quick as a lightning flash, all these thoughts passed through his mind, he didn't stay to debate them. The one and only hope of release was close at hand. His enemy was walking by his side, unconscious of danger. This might be his last opportunity of escape, now or never. In a moment, he turned and with both hands gave Jack a vigorous push but the instinct of life is strong, and muscular action is quick in moments of peril. With the first touch of Ralph's hand, Jack caught him by the wrist, and almost in the act of falling, swung himself round, and stood face to face with his would-be murderer. "'You villain!' he gasped. "'You tried to push me over the cliff!' "'Yes,' was the answer, "'and I will do it yet.' and he sprang upon him like an infuriated tiger. He felt now that he must complete the work that he had begun. He had so far compromised himself that it would never do to let Jack escape. Better they both fell off the cliff than he should fail. It was a moment of madness, when reason for the time being was completely dethroned, and escape the one dominant idea. The struggle was brief, and decisive, yet it seemed an age to both men. Now they swayed on the brink of a cliff, now it seemed as if both would inevitably fall over, now back again, to a place of safer footing. Jack struggled for release, Ralph for conquest. The latter knew if Jack escaped, he would have to run for his life, and leave every hope behind him. No half-measure would do. He had gone so far that he must complete his work. Jack, weakened by recent illness, had not half the strength of his opponent. Ralph, like a lion that had tasted blood, had no mercy. Round each other they spun again and again, now poised on the brink of the cliff, now back again. But Jack was growing weaker all the while, 
and Ralph had forced him onto his knees. To push him over the cliff was now an easy matter. With his feet hanging over, he had only to unloose his hands. In a moment more, that was accomplished, and a jack fell, feet foremost, and disappeared from sight. Ralph, panting and exhausted, stepped quickly back and looked eagerly right and left, but no one was in sight. Evidently, the struggle had not been seen. Smoothing his dishevelled hair and carefully adjusting his necktie, he walked slowly, now in one direction and now in another, but no one appeared upon the scene. Approaching at length the scene of the struggle, he looked over the edge of the cliff. Down at its foot, the blue waters were surging among the rocks, for the tide was nearly at its height, but nothing was to be seen of Jack. If he wasn't killed by the fall, he's been drowned by the tide, he reflected, while the perspiration stood in big drops upon his forehead. Good God, he said at length, that I should have come to this. And leaving the fatal spot, he hurried away with rapid strides in the direction of a farmhouse that could be dimly seen in the distance. There is something very gratifying to someone who produces content on leaving an episode at a cliffhanger. And to do so quite literally brings me great joy indeed. I look forward to seeing you next time on Soft Stories to find out what happens next.